Good afternoon, everyone. We welcome you to the Bay State Health Heart and Vascular Lecture Series. My name is Patrick Schilling, and I am the manager of cardiac rehab here at Bay State Medical Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. We are happy you are able to join us today. This presentation is being recorded for those who are unable to attend today, or if you would like to view this presentation again in the future. All recordings can be found on the baystatehealth.org website. You can also register for any upcoming lecture in the same area on the baystatehealth.org website. We welcome questions you may have regarding this material and we ask we will address them at the end of the presentation. You can type Q and a questions into the Q&A area shown on the bottom of your screen. We simply ask you keep your questions pertinent to the topic today. Finally, you'll have an opportunity to provide comments and feedback about today's presentation immediately following the Zoom presentation. And at this time, I'd like to introduce today's presenter. Elizabeth Jari is a certified nurse practitioner with cardiology at Bay State Medical Wing Medical Center in Palmer. Liz will be talking with us today about cardiac risk factors and how they relate to metabolic syndrome. Liz has been with Bay State since 2008, where she served as an RN in the ED, med surge, telemetry, and intercare units, as well as a clinical nurse supervisor before obtaining her degree at AIC as a nurse practitioner. She has also supported the Springfield Cardiology Clinic and Stress Lab. Liz served with the U.S. Army, where she provided care to U.S. soldiers. She also taught health and oral hygiene in Iraqi villages, assisted medical teams during mass casualty situations, and provided ancillary assistance to medical providers in a combat support hospital in Balad, Iraq. She currently serves as clinical faculty for American International College students in the Family Nurse Practitioner Program. Liz, we thank you for your service and are grateful for your time today. Thank you, Patrick, for that kind introduction. Uh, it truly is an honor to be with everyone today and to be invited to be a part of this panel to talk about some prevention strategies in cardiology. Uh, this is something that's very important to me. It's something that I feel as though I never have enough time to cover in clinic um, with our patients. And so I am very happy to have this full hour with you guys today. I have a lot of content that I'm hoping to cover. I hope um, to not run over in the hour so that you have an opportunity to be able to answer some, so, so I can answer some questions for you. Um, so without further delay, I will start my presentation. I have no disclosures uh, associated with this presentation today. Some of the learning objectives that I'm hoping to cover today include uh, what is the burden of heart disease, what is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, also called ASCVD, warning signs of a heart attack, risk factors for heart disease, and what is metabolic syndrome. Um, I'm also going to be talking about the AHA's Life Essential 8 and um, some guidelines that were put out by the ACC, which is the American College of Cardiology, and the AHA, the American Heart Association. Um, some sobering statistics here. As you can see, uh, one out of every three people in America die from cardiovascular disease. Uh, one person dies every 34 seconds in the United States. And as you can see from this graph here, in 2020, uh, in 2020, it looked like COVID was going to be for the first time um, since measles as a communicable disease to come in, it was predicted to come in first for the leading cause of death. But as you can see by these numbers here, it didn't even come anywhere close to heart disease. Um, so the COVID numbers were about 345,000 and heart disease was nearly double at 690, still taking the lead um, and cancer still coming in for a close second. Interestingly, the um, cancer mortality in middle-aged women has actually gone down, um, but with that heart disease for middle-aged women has gone up. So despite improvements in prevention strategies um, over the years, the prevalence globally is still going up. Um, so 19 million people um, 
globally ar around the world um, every day die of heart disease. And looking at this graph here, so you can see uh, in 2000 that there was a slight decrease in uh, in numbers uh, for age-related deaths. And this was thought to be because of things like statin use and um, the initiative to quit smoking. Um, also, there was a big fat on low calorie diets, uh, low, low fat diets. And so you see this downward um, you know, in, in the number. Um, but unfortunately, right around 2012, you start to see that number start to kind of crawl back up. And it's going back straight upwards. And this is thought to be because of things like uh, the rise in obesity and metabolic syndrome, which I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, in this presentation. So the U.S. burden of heart disease is very high. Um, there are 1.2 million people hospitalized with heart attacks every year, heart stents, bypass surgeries, or heart failure. At BC Medical Center, we have an entire hospital dedicated to these patients. We have a unit um, that... Uh, each floor has patients who had just had a heart attack, another floor dedicated to patients who've had um, procedures done. We have an entire OR for our heart and vascular patients and uh, a full unit full of that's always full, full of heart failure patients. And this is just in the hospital. Um, the medical units also have cardiac patients. Um, so our hospitals really are full with these types of patients. There's a million people who are hospitalized every year with heart failure. Um, the amount of money that's spent uh, in the U.S. for heart disease alone is about $350 billion. So uh, one out of every six healthcare dollars is directly spent on cardiovascular disease. Um, and this is just predicted to go up higher and higher. The American Heart Association actually estimated that um, by 2035, 45% of people are going to have some form of cardiovascular disease. And they estimate the cost to be somewhere around $1.1 trillion. Um, mix this in combination with this big workforce shortage that we have. And even in healthcare, uh, we just don't, we can't fill positions. People are wanting to leave healthcare. They're stressed, they're burnt out. COVID really did a number on a lot of people. And uh, even some surveys that were done a few years ago, specifically looking at nurses, they over 75% of nurses uh, reported feeling burnt out and if given the opportunity would leave healthcare. So what exactly is atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease? You'll hear me call it ASCVD. Um, uh, this is really any disease that involves the buildup of cholesterol plaque um, in arteries. Uh, this includes acute coronary syndrome, per peripheral arterial disease, and events such as myocardial infarction and stroke. So this is a diagram of a uh, normal artery in an artery with plaque. Um, I think by looking at this, you can kind of tell which one is which. The normal artery is the uh, cross section here that's nice and smooth. It's red. Um, there's no deposit of plaque there. And so when thinking about the inside of a normal artery, um, I kind of compare it to a brand new pan that you buy, a Teflon pan. Uh, the coating is, you crack an egg over it, it's a brand new pan, you don't need to use a nonstick spray. It, your egg is able to slide with no issues. Um, or when a Zamboni goes onto the hockey rink, the ice is nice and slippery and smooth. Things are able to flow through the puck. The puck moves nice and smooth. Um, but what happens over time, um, and this happens actually really early in life, and even in childhood, there's fatty streaks that start to deposit uh, onto the artery. And this is from the foods that we eat and um, some other environmental things that happen. And what happens is if you combine that with um, other issues like uh, high blood pressure, um, smoking, uh, inflammation, high cholesterol, poor diet, stress hormones, it causes some 
maybe some what I'll call irritation of the endothelial lining, endothelial dysfunction. And this plaque starts to be able to get into the artery wall. Uh, when that happens, plaque starts to build up a little bit more and uh, a large plaque can form. If this plaque becomes unstable or ruptures, a plot can then develop. In healthy coronary arteries, the blood flows without obstruction. In diseased coronary arteries, a fatty substance called plaque forms in the artery walls, and as the disease advances, may bulge out into the path of the onrushing blood, blocking the oxygen and nutrients the heart desperately needs. And from time to time, causing symptoms like chest pains and shortness of breath. But heart attacks result more often from plaque that does not protrude into the artery itself, but remains hidden in the artery wall. One of the scariest things about coronary artery disease is that it can remain silent for so long. You can have plaque buildup in the coronary that isn't causing you any problem, doesn't cause you any symptoms, doesn't even cause a positive stress test, but suddenly ruptures. It ruptures, it causes a blood clot to form, the rest of the coronary artery, the rest of the pipe suddenly gets blocked and a heart attack occurs. And that's really the most common cause of heart attack. This is what kills people often in the primes of their lives. All plaque is dangerous, but some plaques are unstable, on the verge of rupture. Scientists are today trying to determine how to identify the unstable plaque, while doctors try and help patients minimize their risks. Um, so in this picture here is uh, a heart with the coronary arteries sitting on top of the heart. And these coronary arteries, uh, they vary in size for people, but on average, they're a little bit um, smaller than the diameter of a straw. Um, women tend to have a little bit smaller arteries, but generally speaking, that's the size. There's two main arteries, the left coronary artery and the right coronary artery. The left coronary artery then... Um, uh, splits into two other arteries, the left anterior, which is the artery that goes down the front of the heart, and then the left circumflex, which wraps around the left side of the heart and feeds the back of the heart and the um, left side, and then the right feeding the back of the heart and also the right side. So if you can imagine, um, if you had a blockage, um, say, for example, in the left anterior descending, which is also called the widow maker, and it was up high, then everything downstream below that occlusion would not be getting enough blood, oxygen, and nutrients and uh, can lead to problems, big problems. So unfortunately, um, some people may not have warning signs when they have that plaque rupture and they have that heart attack. And one third of people's first presentation with a heart attack will actually result in death. Um, believe it or not, there are patients who say, you know, working out is hard, exercising is hard. These things, you know, I don't think I need to do them right now. Um, I'm just going to wait until I have a heart attack. And then at that point, I'll eat right and I'll exercise. I'll get my stent. I'll get my blood flow back to the heart and, uh, and then I'll start to worry about it. Um, but the sad reality is, is that one third of people will never get that second chance. The um, out of hospital mortality is unfortunately still very high. So some symptoms of a heart attack, it's important to remember that these can be different um, from person to person, but the most classic symptoms of angina or angina uh, can be felt as a pressure, uh, the elephant sitting on the chest, an ache, tightness, squeezing, or a burning sensation under the breastbone. It often extends to the neck, the jaw, the shoulder, or down the left arm, um, usually the left arm. Uh, this can be associated with other symptoms like nausea or shortness of breath and sweating, or may these symptoms may come on on their own um, without the chest pain. Uh, it is really important 
to know the diabetics and women don't feel angina the same way that men do. And so really they might have a higher risk of having a, what's called a silent heart attack or an unrecognized heart attack with a late presentation. And this is thought because diabetics, they have nerve related damage over time from the high levels of blood sugar in their system. And so that system is kind of numb, it's dull and, and they don't feel those symptoms. So risk factors for cardiovascular disease, the more uh, risk factors you have on the left, the more likely you are to have uh, an event on the right. And uh, there are non-modifiable risk factors, which include genetics, age, ethnicity, and sex. Um, these are things that you really can't control. Um, the, in terms of genetics, there are things like familiar hypercholesterolemia, having LP little a, which we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, in terms of age, 50% uh, of men will have their first cardiac event before the age of 65. That number is a little bit lower in women um, because they have some protection before they hit menopause. After menopause, that number is a little bit higher. Uh, so in women, it's about 35% before the age of 65. And 25% of men will actually have um, their first heart attack before the age of 44. So very young there. Uh, with eth ethnicity, we know that South Asians and African Americans tend to have higher risk. Um, and then the modifiable risk factors, I'm not going to go into that because we're going to go into it a little bit more in detail in just a moment. So bottom line, heart health, it's a serious business, serious as a heart attack, as the saying goes. Um, so what's the good news? Well, there is some good news. And over 80% of heart disease is preventable. So that's very good news. So in 2010, the American Heart Association came out with a set of health metrics that they called Life Simple 7. And what they looked at was seven, seven evidence-based areas to focus on in order to maintain, obtain optimal levels of cardiac function. And they did some clinical trials looking at these seven things, and they saw that there was a positive correlation um, between uh, achieving these lifestyle management guidelines and improvements in heart failure and heart disease. Um, in 2010, uh, I'm sorry, in, in 2022, they actually added um, another component to it uh, the, and changed the name to Life's Essential 8. And they added sleep as an important component to heart health. Um, they also added a diet, um, a guide to be able to assess what your diet looks like. And in terms of the smoking, they also accounted for vaping and secondhand smoke as being um, a risk. Uh, and some adjustments were made to cholesterol and blood sugar levels. So in 2019, the American College of Cardiology and the American Heart Association came together and they came out with some primary prevention guidelines, specifically for healthcare professionals, um, but for the public also to really focus on uh, in an effort to reduce this big burden of um, ASCVD. And so primary prevention is looking to prevent the onset of disease or illness. So what can we do now to prevent somebody from having heart disease versus secondary prevention, which is you already have the disease, you have early signs of it, we're looking to progress it from um, advancing. And uh, so these are some of the takeaways. So number one was promoting a healthy lifestyle throughout uh, life. And this is starting very early, um, right from childhood. This is probably the single most important thing that people can do um, to prevent atherosclerotic heart disease, heart failure, and other um, heart conditions like atrial fibrillation. Number two, is recognizing social determinants of health. Um, and this is really important for, for clinicians to do. Um, telling somebody they need to eat right, exercise and stop smoking, that's obvious. That, that doesn't help anybody at all. Uh, we need to be able to ask, uh, understand what the barriers are for patients. Um, if I tell somebody that they need to start walking every day, well, maybe they use a walker or maybe they live somewhere where it's unsafe to walk. Um, some people don't have access to grocery stores that sell 
um, healthy food. They may have little shops uh, with fast foods or um, gas stations where they get their food. Um, some of our patients depend on meals on wheels for food and they don't get to choose their meals or they live in assisted living facilities where their meals are made for them. And that's how they what they depend on. Um, and also recognizing um, that there are other factors like mental health um, conditions that can affect um, someone's ability to be healthy and stay healthy. So a risk assessment should be done on all patients between the age of 40, 75 years old. So if you fall in this range, you're going in to see your primary care doctor, or maybe you're seeing a cardiologist because you're concerned about some risk factors. Uh, there is a risk calculator that should be used. Uh, this is something that even patients can use on their own. You can access this online. If you go onto the American College of Cardiology, they have um, this ASCVD risk estimator, but you can also find this on a Google search bar. Um, and Basically, what it is, is um, a calculator that looks at things like your gender, your age, your race, your cholesterol numbers, what your blood pressure is. Are you a, a diabetic? Do you have high blood pressure? Are you treated for high blood pressure? And are you a smoker? And based off these numbers, it estimates a two risks, uh, a 10-year risk, which is good for the people between 40 and 75, and then a lifetime risk, which is probably better for people under the age of 40. So as an example, you can see this person here, um, their 10-year risk uh, based off of the numbers they inputted was 19.4%. Um, so where does that put them? So at 19.4%, um, they fall into the intermediate risk. Now you can see that's a big range with the intermediate risk. It, it's between 7.5 to 20%, which is kind of a big range. Um, and so if you're on the lower end of that intermediate risk, uh, you really got to look at other things other than just that number. And this would be things like uh, what we call risk enhancers. Some of the risk enhancers would be um, having a family history of heart disease, um, having familiar hypercholesterolemia, LP little a, um, maybe you have a, a history of premature menopause or an autoimmune condition like lupus, scleroderma, or rheumatoid arthritis, a preeclampsia history, South Asian ancestry, uh, and there's a few more. So that's a way for you to kind of look to see whether, you know, um, you should be on a at least a moderate intensity statin. If there's still question or there's hesitancy to start a statin, um, you know, maybe you fall closer to that 20% range, but you don't have the other risk enhancers and you feel healthy. You don't want to be on a medication and um, you're not completely convinced by this calculator because it isn't hundred percent. It's, it's, uh, it's a tool. Uh, then using a coronary artery calcium can be helpful in that setting. And so what a coronary artery calcium test is, it's a low dose uh, radiation CAT scan, similar to a bilateral mammogram in, in terms of uh, radiation that can be done. It's an eight minute test. Um, that looks at the amount of calcified plaque that has built up in, in the heart. And so generally speaking, if your score is zero, you're considered low risk. Um, now, of course, if you have diabetes, have a family history, uh, you, you do need to keep that in mind that it's you're not completely out of the woods. Um, if you fall between one and 99 on that coronary artery calcium score, then especially if you're over the age of 55, then you may benefit from having a statin added to your regimen. And then certainly if you fall uh, over a hundred or in the 75 percentile, which is calculated uh, using the MESA calculator, then definitely being on a statin would lower the risk. Um, very busy slide. I I'm just going to put it up there for a second. I didn't want to go without talking about LP little a. Um, if you haven't heard about LP little a, you are going to hear about LP little a. Um, and this is because there's some new medications in the horizon. Uh, in the past, there were none. And so this is not something that we were routinely checking our patients for because there was really no good um, 
treatment options available for them. And so uh, it is genetic. It is something that's inherited. Uh, one of the parents pass it down to you. Uh, it's it's somewhat common. In fact, one in five people will have elevated levels of this lipoprotein. Um, and it is something that can be passed down to uh, a one in 50% 50, uh, uh, 50 chance to be passed down to one of your children. And so basically what um, lipoprotein A is very similar to the LDL um, cholesterol. So LDL cholesterol um, has an apol lipoprotein B attached to it. And that's that lipoprotein is, is atherogenic. Um, that's how it gets inside of the artery wall is through this atherogenic uh, lipoprotein. And so LP little a not only has that, it has another um, lipoprotein attached to it called apol lipoprotein A. And the problem with apol lipoprotein A is that it um, competes with plasminogen, which is an enzyme that our body uh, uses to uh, bust a clot. And so say this apolipoprotein or the LP little a attaches to a clot, then the normal body response um, to break up that clot with plasminogen isn't able to happen. And so now you just have this clot there and it's getting bigger in size and that um, can cause an obstruction. Um, the other concern with this is that it has oxidized phospholipids, and this is what allows it to get into the cellular wall um, through oxidation into the cellular wall. Um, this is also important for people who maybe have aortic stenosis, especially at a young age, and there's really no good explanation as to how they got aortic stenosis. So there's no congenital reason for them to have it. They don't have a bicuspid valve. Um, they don't have chronic kidney disease, but they have this aortic stenosis. This is, could be from like having lipoprotein A. Um, it causes calcification to be deposited onto the valve, which then causes it to become stiff and not open very well. So I wanted everyone to be aware of that. Um, so going back to the guidelines, number four, um, all adults should consume a healthy diet. And here is a list of some healthy foods. Um, vegetables, fruits, nuts, whole grains, protein from vegetable or fish sources, um, avoiding trans fats, minimizing or avoiding bread or processed meats, and avoiding or limiting refined carbs, sugar, and alcohol. Um, so this is a popular question. What is the best diet? Um, and this actually has been looked at through some studies. There has, have been a lot of studies looking at the best diet and the two diets that seem to come out on top specifically when it comes to heart health is the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet. So the Mediterranean diet is, um, a diet that is, uh, it's, it's traditional cuisines from um, Greece, from Italy and other countries that border the Mediterranean Sea. And these diets are rich in whole foods, whole grains, vegetables, legumes. Um, olive oil is the main source of their added fat. And there is some suspicion that maybe it's the olive oil that is kind of the secret to the Mediterranean diet because this is uh, very anti-inflammatory. Um, they do eat some fish, some seafood, dairy, and poultry, but it's really only in moderation. And red meats and sweets, that's very rare, maybe for a birthday. Um, it's not a part of the everyday diet. Um, and then the DASH diet is very similar in the types of food, but the goal with the DASH diet is more for reduction of blood pressure and blood uh, uh, and cholesterol. Um, the focus is also on losing weight with the DASH diet. So you're looking more at portion size um, and then also eating certain nutrients that have high levels of magnesium, calcium, and potassium, because we know these things also help to lower blood pressure naturally. Um, so it's not a vegetarian diet, but these aren't vegetarian diets, but if you look, they kind of mostly are, it's, it's mostly a plant-based diet. So here's an example of what a Mediterranean or dashed uh, plate looks like. Notice that it has lots of colors, um, lots of vegetables. You got protein from the hummus. You have some, um, maybe some beans there. So the general rule is the more color, the more fiber that's going to be in the food, the more antioxidants and the more anti-inflammatory it's going to be for you. 
Um, aiming for a healthy weight is important um, because being overweight and obese can cause the heart to work harder. Uh, one of my favorite episodes on Biggest Loser, I don't know if anybody remembers this show, but it was a show where these really large, you know, 400 pound people would lose a crazy amount of weight, like 250 pounds, half their body weight. And at the end of the show, they would have to carry a rucksack with the amount of weight that they lost. And so say they lost 200 pounds, they'd start the race, which was a half marathon, 12 miles, carrying 200 pounds on their back. Now, as you can imagine, they were only able to walk a couple of steps. Um, and then every know, half mile, they got to unload some of the weight. And by the time they got to the 12 miles, it took them many, many hours, um, but they were lighter, they were able to move. And it kind of represented what that weight felt like um, when they had to walk around and carry it. They couldn't walk, they struggled, they couldn't breathe. Um, and the heart has to work harder, has to beat heart uh, faster and harder. Um, so when aiming for a healthy weight and, and looking at diet, it is really important to prioritize nutrition and food quality over just calorie restriction um, for weight loss and minimizing high glycemic carbs. Um, number five on the guidelines, um, talk about exercise. This is really important. Um, 150 minutes a week of moderate intensity exercise. So these are things that you could probably do having a conversation with somebody, um, brisk walking, um, you know, maybe some yoga, uh, 75 minutes per week or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise. So this would be more like singles, tennis, um, jogging things that it's not so easy to have a conversation. Um, if you're doing these things. So lots of benefits to exercise in terms of the cardiovascular system. Um, the more exercise you do, the more you're going to be able to do. Uh, so increase in exercise tolerance, you reduce body weight, which also helps to reduce blood pressure, reduction in um, bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, and increases good cholesterol, and then also increases insulin sensitivity. Um, aside from the cardiovascular benefits, I think a lot of people know that there are uh, benefits with lowering risk of certain types of cancer. Um, also, there were some recent studies that looked at um, cognition benefits, lowering risk of dementia, anxiety, depression, improves bone health, it lowers the risk of uh, falls and other associated injuries, helps with balance. Um, so number six is for adults with type 2 diabetes. Um, lifestyle is very crucial. So this is a high risk group. Um, I did have a video that I, I think I'm having some sound issues, um, but it's, it's a really good video. I, I won't play it, but I'll leave it here for people to go back to and look at. Um, but basically if you have type two diabetes, it's kind of like you already have, um, cardiovascular disease, they come hand in hand. Um, and this is just because of the mechanism of how the insulin resistance works in the body and how that can contribute to heart disease. So for these people, it's a non-negotiable dietary changes, exercise recommendations. And if they do need medications, um, metformin is usually the first line followed by other agents like SGLT2 inhibitors um, or GLP-1 receptor agonists. The pathogenesis of diabetes-related atherosclerosis involves several general mechanisms. The first relates to metabolic factors, including dyslipidemia, hypertension, increased free fatty acids, and hyperglycemia from insulin resistance with insulin deficiency, all of which contribute to the process of atherosclerosis, among other things. Hyperglycemia itself increases oxidative stress and glycation. This release of free radicals increases lipid and lipoprotein peroxidation, contributing to foam cell formation on arterial walls. Insulin resistance plays a role by contributing to endothelial dysfunction through loss of nitric oxide, an important precursor to atherosclerosis. Diabetes promotes platelet aggregation, which is the result of an increased inflammatory response that augments the generation of growth factors and also stimulates the proliferation and migration of smooth muscle cells, both of which are associated with thrombosis. Diabetes is considered a pro-thrombotic state, which can lead to an imbalance in atherosclerotic lesions and plaque instability. Diabetes-related atherosclerosis increases the risk of cardiovascular disease, including myocardial infarction. 
Um, so I, I do want to talk about metabolic syndrome, another kind of buzzword topic that you're probably going to be hearing a lot about if you haven't already. Um, I do apologize. I think I'm running kind of close on time here. So I'm going to be talking a little fast, but it's because I want to leave it open for um, questions at the end. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on metabolic syndrome, um, also called insulin resistance syndrome. And so basically what metabolic syndrome is, is uh, it's a constellation of um, symptoms that, that people have um, that increases their risk of having uh, cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, type two diabetes, uh, neurocognitive disorders. And it's because these people are living in this chronic low-grade systemic in inflammatory um, state. And it's it's kind of urgent um, to be able to diagnose somebody with this because the longer you go <clears throat> with metabolic syndrome, um, the more likely you are to have problems associated with it. And this would be things like having stroke, diabetes, and then um, heart-related uh, issues. Um, so what does it look like? So in, uh, metabolic syndrome is can be any three of these five things. So high triglycerides, visceral obesity, having insulin resistance, low HDL, and hypertension. Um, the exact criteria, specific criteria used is um, having an abdominal obesity uh, or waist circumference greater than 40 in men and 35 in women, having high triglycerides above 150, low HDL above 40, uh, lower than 40 in men and lower than 50 in women, having high blood pressure over 130 over 88, and a fasting glucose of 110. And remember, you just need three out of these five. Okay. And uh, so risk factors that are associated with it. Um, so if, as you get older, you're at a higher risk of developing this 40% people over the age of 60, it is more prevalent African Americans and Latins. However, the Caucasian prevalence is rapidly increasing. Um, unfortunately, going back to age, we are actually seeing this more in our adolescent population. And this is thought to be because they are eating more carbs, more sugar at younger ages. Um, if you are obese or have um, abdominal obesity, if you have a family history of diabetes or gestational diabetes, or have other diseases like hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and history of PCOS. Um, so this is Alberto. Uh, I don't know if anybody can relate to Alberto or if anybody knows in Alberto, um, but Alberto, he actually represents a quarter of the the world's population. So Alberto, he's 67 years old, um, a little overweight, uh, he's not very active. He'd like to be, but his knees hurt, his back hurts, and this limits him from being active. Used to smoke, but he quit. Um, he's been smoke-free since January 1st. Nobody ever got excited about his cholesterol. It's about 200. Triglycerides are a little high at 182. He's got low HDL at 32. LDLs at 135. And no one's ever told him that his glucose was a problem. It was 142 the last time it was checked. Blood pressure is a little high, 158 over 92. He blames that I'm being nervous when he goes to the doctor. Um, but really, Aldo is walking around with metabolic syndrome and probably isn't aware of it. Um, and unfortunately, maybe his doctors have not had a conversation with him about his metabolic syndrome. Um, so when treating metabolic syndrome, really the biggest goal is going to be to lower the risk of heart disease um, and preventing type 2 diabetes. And if you do have type 2 diabetes, really getting aggressive with treating it. So this is um, what the American Diabetic Association calls normal blood sugar levels. And you can see this is for people with diabetes and people without diabetes. Um, I expect that maybe in the future, these numbers might be a little bit lower. We might get a little more aggressive with what we call normal. Um, so number seven, going back to the guidelines, um, is quitting smoking. I think everyone knows that smoking is harmful. Um, and what people should know is that when you do smoke, what, what is, what's happening, um, to the body on a cellular level is with every drag of the cigarette, you're actually inhaling carbon monoxide, um, which which goes into the lungs and then it binds to the red blood cell at the site where oxygen would normally be. And so you're exchanging this carbon monoxide for, for oxygen. So there's less oxygen um, that's 
being uh, that's available for the heart, for the muscles, and for the rest of the body. Um, and then the the actual exposure to um, smoke causes endothelial dysfunction. So that increases inflammation. And remember, we talked about that Teflon coating on the pan. Um, every time you smoke, it's literally like taking a fork or a metal spatula on that pan and causing that endothelial dysfunction. Um, the benefits of smoking are immediate. Um, as you can see here, within 20 minutes, there is a physiological change, and then it continues into um, up to 10 years, your death of lung cancer decreases by half uh, when you quit smoking. Uh, number eight on the guidelines, talk about aspirin. This gained a lot of um, publicity around 2019 after a pretty big um, clinical trial came out called the Esprit trial. Um, this was specifically looking at elderly, um, but there have been other trials that closely look at aspirin. And really at the end, what they found in terms of primary prevention, so you don't have any um, cardiovascular condition or any vascular condition, that there really wasn't any benefit to just taking an aspirin to prevent an event from happening. Um, and this is especially true if you have a history of bleeding, um, then you really shouldn't be taking it for primary prevention. Uh, if you've had a heart attack, a stroke, or a stent, or other vascular condition, and you're prescribed aspirin, those are the folks that should be taking aspirin, so secondary prevention. Um, if you're over 60 and there's really no evidence that you have heart disease, or history of vascular disease, no need for an aspirin. Um, and then for the people in the 40, 59 year old age group, using that 10 year ASCVD risk calculator we talked about, um, or using the CAC score, if it's greater than 100, maybe consider aspirin. But even then, you really are only getting a marginal benefit. Um, you probably would get more bang for your buck if you focus on things like um, quitting smoking, lowering your blood pressure, and lowering cholesterol. Um, number nine talks about statins. So who should be on a statin? So people who should be on a statin, despite any calculative risk, um, tool should be people who have very high levels of LDL. And these are people that we typically see as um, either having some kind of genetic um, predisposition like familial hypercholesterolemia, uh, elevated levels above 190. Um, because the more LDL you have floating around, the higher the risk that those LDL particles can get into the cell wall and cause plaque to build up. Um, if you're a diabetic and you're between the ages of 40 and 75 years old, probably should be on an aspirin. Um, again, going back to that video, you see how having diabetes causes heart disease. Um, or if you use the calculator and your risk is high or you have other risk enhancers. Um, again, a busy slide. This is just the ACC um, primary prevention expert consensus pathway, and it's splitting it up by age um, and, and also looking at risk. Um, so just to kind of mention some other risk enhancers that I didn't mention um, were persistent elevated triglycerides, having a elevated high sensitivity CRP, um, having LP little a and ApoB levels would be uh, independent risk enhancers. Um, so number 10 is treating hypertension. Um, for everybody, the first line of treatment um, is always going to come down to diet, exercise, reducing salt intake, treating sleep apnea if you have it. Um, and then if you do need medications for for hypertension, then really making sure that you are setting a goal to be less than 130 over 80. So these are the numbers. These numbers changed in 2017. Um, and if, as you can see here, stage one hypertension is now 130 to 139 over 80 to 89. And this number used to be a little bit higher. It was 140 over 90. Um, so with that change, a lot more people got diagnosed with having um, stage one hypertension. And so a lot more people um, hopefully will be treated. And, and of course, as I said, the first treatment should always be diet and exercise and lifestyle changes as number one. Um, so why is high blood pressure harmful? Um, I think it's pretty obvious, but uh, it does increase resistance in the blood or the artery wall. We talked about that inner layer, that artery wall. We want to protect it. We want to keep it nice and smooth. And if you have a lot of resistance, it's going to cause some damage um, to the heart. And it also causes the heart to work harder if your blood pressure is up. 
um, getting enough sleep. This was the component that was added um, in 2022. Uh, for Life's Essential 8. So sleep is so very important. Uh, there was a 2021 review of research, which is called NEMEN analysis, that was done and it had a large group, 300,000 um, patients. And they found that those who didn't get enough sleep had a significantly increased risk of metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome can come from insulin resistance, but it also can come from um, things like high cortisol levels, um, high levels of um, norepinephrine, adrenaline in the body. And so the lack of sleep increases that cortisol, which increases metabolic syndrome. Um, and even one night of sleep deprivation reduces insulin sensitivity in the body. Um, so the recommendation is between seven and eight hours of sleep. Um, quality matters. So you really got to look to see whether um, you, you know, assessing things for sleep apnea. Um, so this is a tool that we use. It's called the stop bang screening tool. And uh, if you have four of these things here, then uh, you really should probably think about getting a sleep study. Um, the other thing I'll just put out there too, um, I have a lot of patients, a lot of elderly patients who tell me that they get up to go to the bathroom at night a lot. And the males, they assume that it's related to prostate issues and the women, they uh, sometimes we'll blame it on medications and, and all of that can be true. Um, but what people should also know is that if you have sleep apnea and your body is not getting enough oxygen at night, it actually causes the kidneys to have to work a little bit harder. Um, and so then at that, you start to, if the kidneys are working harder, you have to go to the bathroom. And so that can also be a sign that there could be some sleep apnea going on. Uh, managing stress is important. Um, so chronic stress, we talked about the cortisol levels, increases blood pressure, increases weight and type 2 diabetes. Um, interesting, people who perceive their job as being stressful are more likely to develop metabolic syndrome. Uh, so it's interesting that you have two people doing the exact same job and one person, nothing in the world seems to bother them. And then another person is very type A and hyped up. And uh, that person is actually at a little bit of a higher risk of developing metabolic syndrome. Um, so perception is everything. Um, if you're under a lot of stress, this causes nerves uh, to send signals to the artery to start to constrict and start to tighten. So on a physiological level, um, the body's natural response to the fight or flight um, mechanism is to tighten, clamp. And uh, if, think about it, if you already have a narrowing to the vessel and now you're tightening it more with stress that doesn't go away, it's less... Um, it's, it's like taking away a lane of traffic. You, you have the same amount of blood, but it's not able to get through. Um, so some stress relievers we have uh, here, lots of ways for people to relieve stress, getting active, breathing exercises, prayer, meditation, mindfulness, laughing more, connecting with others, trying yoga, getting enough sleep, keeping a journal and going outdoors. Um, so I really hope that people can hear this because it's a one minute meditation that I wanted to put here. So let me see. Close your eyes and we'll take a few moments to calm your mind and body. Soften your face, your neck and shoulders. Do your best to fully let go. And turn your attention to the breath, the calming breath, the soothing breath. Take long, slow breaths, full and deep. Breathing in, I am calm. Breathing out, I'm at peace. So my favorite quote from the Dalai Lama, um, there are only two things, uh, there are only two days in the year that nothing can be done. One is called yesterday and the other is called tomorrow. So today is the right day to love, believe, do, and mostly live. Here are some resources that I can um, leave up for people who want to be able to access this information online. And with that, I am open for any um, questions. Wow, thank you so much, Liz, for 
um, a wonderful presentation, especially love the videos and your explanations and just fantastic. So thank you. Um, we do have a few questions in the Q&A. Um, I'll do my best to first read them and then you can mm -hmm. respond. So our first question um, says, what happens if you have been on a statin for almost 20 years and recently your statin level is going up? Also, blood glucose is going up. Um, she just says that her demographic, she's a female, age 67. She does have a history of cholesterol. Um, I think she's asking for what are the treatment guidelines, I guess, for the next level is if you're noticing these trends go on. Okay. Um, so it sounds, I, I think I might have, what you might have maybe meant to say is you've been on statin for a while and what happens if maybe your LDL number is going up? Is, is that how the question is being asked? Uh, very similar. She said statin level is going up. Statin so level. I'm not sure okay. if it's in regards to the cholesterol level going up or the statin response to the cholesterol level going up. Okay. Okay. So I'll answer in both ways. Um, so if you've been on a statin for a long time and the statin doesn't seem to be working um, and, and you don't think it's working because you're not getting to goal. Um, so for instance, uh, you've had an event, you're, you're, taking this medication for sec secondary prevention, we're a little bit stricter, stricter with our goals. So we want your LDL to um, be below 70, um, but you're not getting there with the statin. It could be um, the, your something with your diet. It could be um, maybe there is some genetic um, thing going on and those numbers really are, are not getting to where they need to be. Um, then at that point, looking at other options that might be available. And fortunately, now there are a lot of um, pharmacological options that are available um, aside from just being on a statin. Um, there's medications like Zetia, which can help to lower that level a little bit more, about 20%, and some other newer agents like our injectable PCSK9 inhibitor, inhibitors. And these are really doing a good job in lowering that number um, to up to 50% in some people. Um, so there are options and I definitely encourage, especially if you've had an event, um, to talk with your provider about some of those other options that may be available. Okay. Uh, I'm going to try and group a few questions together just so that they, they can be wide ranging on this topic of lifestyle. So, um, our next one is on statins, since we were just on the topic, can statins reverse some of the damages done? I believe they're referring to the vessels. That's a really great question, and I'm so glad you asked. Um, yes, statins do. So I think the question was, was can statins help to reverse um, the existing disease? And to a degree, it, it can. Um, now you combine that with things like diet, um, specifically the Mediterranean diet, more plant-based um, diet, and absolutely you can have some regression of disease. Now it's not going to get rid of it completely, um, but it will definitely help um, with, with regression. The other thing that a statin does is it's anti-inflammatory, and it also helps to stabilize the plaque that's there. And so as you can remember in that video, um, the plaque can be hanging out on the wall and it's tight on the wall. It's just there. But at any point, that plaque can become unstable, especially if it's that soft plaque that has a mix of those white cells and those inflammatory compounds, and it can just chip off at any point, And that can form um, a clot in the space where it was existing, or that plaque itself um, can cause a blockage within the artery. And so the statins, what they do is they, they stabilize that plaque. They keep it there. They prevent it from going anywhere. Um, and then they do allow for some regression as well. I think we'll go on to another group of questions. Um, so there's a few questions about diet. Um, the first one talks about what are your thoughts on a keto diet and kind of also a segue into that. What are your thoughts on in intermittent fasting to help the heart work less? 
Again, very good questions. Uh, so keto diet is, um, it definitely has its role for certain patients. Having said that, uh, you got to be really careful with the keto diet um, because the keto diet encourages high fats and um and also some oils. And if you have heart disease uh, already, or you have other genetic things like um, familial hypercholesterolemia, having higher levels of saturated um, fat in the blood is not always a good idea. Um, and it can actually cause some problems. Having said that, People who, um, especially people who have metabolic syndrome, we know that these people actually tend to do better on very low carb diets, um, minimizing high glycemic foods. So I think, you know, the keto diet in itself um, may be okay for people who don't have heart disease. I, I would be very careful, you know, with prescribing a keto diet for people just because of the amount of saturated fats. Um, Low carb, probably good for, for people with metabolic syndrome. And then um, intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, that is also another strategy that has been used in people with metabolic syndrome. And it's actually been shown to have some, some positive outcomes. Um, looking at time-restricted eating, there was some studies that were done that looked at like eating um, in, in like an eight-hour period. Um, and they compared it to people who ate meals throughout the day, there wasn't a huge, um, difference between, you know, weight loss and, and, um, benefits like that, but people specifically who had insulin resistance, um, had did a little bit better with getting their numbers down. Um, so to answer, you know, both diets, they definitely have their role in, in certain, um, populations in certain groups. So talking with your provider would probably be the best thing to see what's best for you. Um, there are a few questions that are very specific to individuals that have typed in a little bit of their history. I'm going to skip those and I'm going to direct you to, to take those questions, please, to your primary care physician or cardiologist, where you can get more detailed answers specific to your health history. Um, I do have a couple of questions. We're running a little short on time, so I think we're down to our last two questions. But can you explain a little bit about the calcium the coronary calcium test, I believe it was on the Dr. Wasserman um, series, but if you could just give us a brief synopsis of calcium coronary calcium testing. Absolutely, I would love to. Um, so coronary artery calcium test is a really good screening test. Um, so remember we said heart disease is the number one killer, um, number one cause of death in the United States uh, with cancer being second. But when you look at cancer, they have some really great screening tools. They have a mammogram for breast cancer. They have colonoscopies looking at colon cancer. Well, we have this screening test called a coronary artery calcium test. Um, test that we can use for, for people usually over the age of 40, um, because before 40, there's just not enough time for calcification to build up um, in the artery wall. Um, but we can use this test to help us kind of further risk stratify a patient who may be on the fence about whether or not they're high risk. Because remember, we talked about that calculator. It's a good calculator. It's, it's the best we have. And th this calculator kind of came about out after many, many years, 40 years of following people um, to see what the biggest risk factors were. But you know, we know that there are other risk enhancers um, that we need to keep in mind. And so by using a coronary artery calcium test, um, very easy to do, uh, eight minute test, you lay down on a CAT scan machine, low dose radiation, same radiation a woman would get for a mammogram. Um, we're able to see how much calcification over which artery of the heart, uh, I'm sorry, which artery in the heart is um, if it's built up. And if it's a zero, generally speaking, you probably have somewhere between five to 10 years. Um, you're a little bit more in the safe zone um, versus somebody who has calcified uh, plaque already in their system. If you have calcified plaque in your system, you need to act now. There's something that needs to be done, whether it's starting a statin, really getting aggressive with lifestyle changes, um, because now at this point you have disease. Um, two more questions. So first question is, is the, the lipoprotein A uh, subtype of blood test? 
Yes, it actually is a blood test that's non-fasting. Um, it can be done at any time. Actually, at the age of two years old, the number that you have is probably the number you're going to live with unless these new medications become available. And I'm very hopeful that they they will. Um, it, it is important to keep in mind that this number can um, mm -hmm. vary by a couple of points, but it is basically within a few points, the number that you'll have for the rest of your life, unless you're treated for this condition. Um, there are certain drugs that will help to lower that number a little bit, um, but we don't really know what the outcomes and what that means with a lower number. And that would be like PCSK9 inhibitors. Um, statins, they actually do increase that number, but statins also help to stabilize plaque. Um, and it's really the best option that we have right now um, in, in treating known coronary disease with uh, for statins. Um, the last question I have is, I think for this general population, a really good one. Um, we know with secondary prevention, when people have heart events, they generally get assigned a cardiologist. But um, from a lifestyle perspective, is there a particular age that someone should be referred to a cardiologist or a nurse practitioner um, to ha have more detailed workups done of their heart disease risks? Absolutely. Um, so people before the age of 40 who may want to see a cardiologist or have a discussion with their primary about whether they need to see a cardiologist for primary prevention um, would be number one, absolutely people who have a family history of heart disease. Um, you know, sometimes people say, oh, well, my grandmother had a heart attack and she was 85. It really, it's early age of coronary disease. So, you know, my ears are going to perk up if you told me that your father had a heart attack at the age of 46 or, you know, anybody between the age in, in their fifties. Um, so if you have a family history, um, if you personally have high cholesterol um, with very high LDLs, like above 150 to 190, um, this could be uh, a sign that you have familial hypercholesterolemia, hypercholesterolemia which is a genetic condition. Um, as a woman, if you have a history of having preeclampsia, um, so in your pregnancy, you developed preeclampsia um, or early menopause, um, or you're found to have LP little a um, in, in, in some blood tests that were done, um, these are all good reasons to come in and uh, see a cardiologist or have a discussion with your primary about being referred to see a cardiologist um, before the age of 40. Thank you, Liz, again, for this tremendous presentation and your knowledge, um, just fantastic. Uh, thank you also to everyone who has joined today. Um, we really appreciate you joining us on Sunday and your participation in our Heart and Vascular Lecture Series. Um, if you would like to see recordings of these series, you can visit the baystatehealth.org website or baystatehealth.org forward slash heart series. Thank you again for your time and attention. and. We hope you have a wonderful day. Bye. Thank you so much for having me.